is the Glass Cannon Network. Welcome to Cannon Fodder, a behind-the-scenes look at the Glass Cannon Network. Yo! What is going on, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome back to Cannon Fodder. It is Wednesday, October 4th, 2023, and I'm your old pal, Joey O'Brien. And I'm Troy. (laughs) <laughs> Taking a day off from Creativity La Valley. I'm just going by one name now. That's what that's what I am uh, in this industry. Just Troy. What were you doing when I was when I fired up the show? Were you, uh, were you played Starfield. They don't worry about it. I was you just it Starfield. Over just there? play a little bit. Yeah, I'll tell you what. I never liked Xbox. My whole life, I was just like very anti Xbox. I was a Nintendo guy until I booked that uh, voice on the original Red Dead Redemption. Then I bought a PlayStation, and then I was like all about PlayStation. That was PlayStation Three. Uh, and then uh, you know Halo. You've I've watched you play Halo. I'm just like, yeah, it's not my bag. I don't like it. Well, <laughs> obviously, I was gifted this from my wife uh, for my birthday so I could play Starfield. And I fucking love it. <laughs> this even the controller just feels gorgeous in my hand. I used to be a really, really big fan of the old Texture. Xbox 360 controller, which I still have for uh, PC now. But I never upgraded to the. What do you have? Xbox uh, Series X or something. Series X, yeah. Is that an Xbox One Series X? Is that what that is, or is that a different console than Xbox One? I don't it's even know latest, where we latest are. The latest, latest one. <laughs> yeah, I don't know where we are in the generations of Xbox, but I have not had one since the 360, and I've grown to like the PlayStation controller. Like I first played oh, yeah. PlayStation, loved it. Moved on to Xbox and was like, this is a superior controller. Used it for a <laughs> long time. Went back to Xbox, was like, I can't even play a first person shooter with these controls on Xbox like, or on uh, PlayStation, I hate it. And then I grew to like it and then I grew to comfortable with it. And then when I went back to Xbox, I'm like, this is very, very difficult. Like, I don't, so I haven't tried the new one though, the new Xbox oh, controller. Dude, it's great. Like the, uh, the triggers and are like textured on top and it just it's a it's got some uh, texturing back here as well it's really like ergonomically beautiful and uh I'm, i i wish i was playing it i haven't played starfield in five days because i'll never be able to play it again me neither, me neither. <laughs> all day today like that's I had all i no, want to do i had no recordings today except fodder which i don't consider a recording i just consider it hanging out right. and i like I was like, I will definitely get an hour of Starfield in at lunch. Like, not a single minute of Starfield. Because every time you're about to play, you're like, I, I, I need to get this done. This this has to get done right now. And then time just <laughs> flies away just, from you. It's I imagine so I imagine it'll get better sometime in the next couple of months. But right now, it's just like... Yeah, I'm just waiting for dead of winter, yeah. holiday season. It'll be slower. There'll they'll, they'll be time. They'll be yeah. Don't worry. Yeah, I mean, we just finished uh, recording uh, season five, getting the trunk. Oh, That's off dude, our are you plate. Dropping hints? That's off our plate, bro. Behind the scenes <laughs> productions uh, <laughs> secrets. Getting the trunk season five is in the bag, folks. It's over. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I <laughs> can't say any more about that. But we do have a ton to talk about today. Nice, nice, yeah. chunky fod. We have exciting news today and exciting updates coming your way, including a brand new RPG that we're going to be checking out this month. What? Ooh, baby. Uh, a property you are all, I'm sure, familiar with. Um, then we're going to talk about uh, the episode, of course, and we'll make time for We Are Stupid. Obviously, not a lot of rules in this particular episode. However, we're going to have a nice little conversation, a little back and forth. I think we've been doing this so far with the GCP, courtesy of Professor Eric. He likes to kick off little debates when there aren't rules things and say, hey, what do you guys feel about this? Here's kind of what the community thinks about this overall concept. And uh, let's put it out there for discussion among among the niche. So we're going to have a nice, nice show today. But to, to kick us off, let's let's get into the news. The news, uh, we mentioned New York Comic Con. Just a reminder, just a real quick bit on that. Two weeks away now. We're two weeks from uh, that, yeah. New York Comic Con. Uh, Friday, October 13th, 4 p.m., right? Yeah, I think it's 4 to 6 30. No, that's not five right. To Four, 6:30. 5 to 6:30. 5 to 6:30. So yeah. it's a 5 p.m. start at New York Comic Con. Uh but yeah, double check, you know, to to you know the website to Is it on the website? Did we ever put that up there? We got to put uh, that up there. There's it went up on social a couple days ago, all the details. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah, we'll have obviously more information as we get closer that we'll really really nail it down. But if you already 4:30 to 6. 4:30 to 6. 
Four thirty to six. Yeah. So if you are already going to uh, New York Comic Con, come by, see the show. It's going to be amazing. Uh, we'll have cast announcements on that. I'm sure next week. All right. Let's talk about Extra Life. We're a month out, dude, and it yeah. is time to mention Extra Life. We're a month ahead of the curve here this year, and uh, Extra Life is your baby. You you love it. So please uh, talk to us. <laughs> talk, talk to us about it and. Uh, and where you're at right now with the process. Um, I was going to say the cast is already out for the the Marvel show. That Oh, oh it is. Okay. Yeah, we're recording this a couple days early, so I think it will already be out there by now. It's going to be me, you, Skid, Matthew, Sydney, Niccolo, and Jim's up. I mean, and just Jim's up. Crazy cast. That's going to be a lot <laughs> Amazing of Amazing Marvel cast. And from what I understand, probably not original superheroes, right? Like we're going to be playing Marvel favorites. Marvel uh, favorites. Yeah. And yeah. a rather uh, spooky Friday the 13th show. <laughs> oh, you love themed shows. Oh, I sure do. No, it's going to be fun. I and mean, it's going to be great. I'm just psyched to play that again. We haven't played since Gen Con, so it'll be good to to get back in. And I, we haven't played with Jim in a long time. You've never played with him. He's great. I've um, never played with Jim. And I, I've, I've met Jim a few times at, at Hangs, mm-hmm. and he just seems awesome. Seems yeah, like an awesome dude. Pure positive energy. He's Canadian. Yeah. They're so so much better than us in every way. <laughs> they really are. Uh, but Extra Life. Yeah, we started this, I want to say, in 2017, dude. We started doing Extra Life when it was just like the five of us. Maybe we had a second show by then, and we were just playing video games and party games. Maybe. I don't even know if we did RPG. It was just like just video games, and we did tw- almost 24 hours. Skid would do the overnight shift. Then I think we took a year off, maybe even two years off, and we came back pretty heavy. I was like, you know, this is something we really need to do. We get so wrapped up in the day-to-day. We really need to find uh, more opportunities to do uh, charity stuff like this. And this is – it doesn't get better um, in terms of like uh, charities that go on in the gaming world than uh, the – the the extra life stream, which is to benefit the children's uh, miracle network of hospitals, children's hospitals all around the United States. We do it. Uh, we've done it now for the past few years, and and really, uh, really, the nation has stepped up. Last year, we earned um, uh, over forty three thousand dollars. So I'm setting the goal this year at forty five thousand. I think we can get forty five. I was going to go all the way to fifty. I was like, let's do five five k bumps a year. Last year, the goal was forty. We blew past it to forty three. We're going to do 45K this year, and the goal is 24 hours of uh, some kind of gaming. So I'm really excited. <laughs> uh, it has not been programmed yet. Uh, it's yep. it's still a little up in the air, but we're excited to, to do as much gaming as we can. Uh, hopefully we get to all 24 hours. It'll just be McDermott yeah. just asleep on a microphone. <laughs> He's got that overnight <sighs> shift now. <sighs> Maybe we got to give that to Francis. Like the new guy always has to do the, uh, yes. the 24 hours. <laughs> <laughs> new guy's got to do 24 hours. Oh, I love that idea. That's great. Yeah, uh, Francis has been, he's been a little bit, he's been jonesing, I think, a little bit to like dip the toe back into the old video game waters. I think he's been out of the loop for a long time and, you know, being around us all the time and now the community all the time and the business all the time. He's just like, I, I got to get back in. <laughs> so good. I want to get to the point where that's all I'm doing. Yes. Uh, but we're not there yet. Uh, but this is going to be going down uh, Saturday, November 4th. We start at 8 a.m. And we'll try to go to 8 a.m. on Sunday, November 5th. Uh, straight or straight into some bagels and locks like we did last year. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. All right. Let's talk about the new game we have coming this month. We uh, a, a spoiler alert. I have received via email a quick start guide for a new game uh, that's coming out. And uh, starting to read through that little document. Why don't you, uh, why don't you tell the folks what we're going to be displaying our first uh, run of later this month. Yeah, um, we are going to be playing the, I, don't, I think it's not not even, not even brand new, the upcoming uh, Assassin's Creed tabletop RPG. <laughs> yes. Uh, I'm really excited about this. I don't want to announce the cast yet, even though we've locked it in, just because uh, we, we, we we got some a little high profile, uh, someone, a fr- friend of the network, uh, a, a regular on the network. But I just assume in between now and then, so much could happen to make this yeah. person too busy to play. But uh, I've never played with them. You've never played with them. And we're going to be on it. And so I, I'm excited. Uh, I have not even looked at the quick start guide yet. Were you a big Assassin's Creed guy for PlayStation or Xbox? Or no, no, not not at all. I, I played a little bit of the very, very first game. And then for whatever reason, I just I, I don't finish most games I play. But I, I never even got close to finishing that. And um, 
I didn't dislike it. I don't know. Just one of those things. Life just sort of carried me in a different direction at the time. And then I never played a single sequel. I never played Origins, which I hear is great, or uh, Black Flag, which I almost played at one point because I was like in the mood for a pirate themed game. Uh, and then, I mean, there's so many. There's like the Roman one. There's like, you know, it's all just different times in history. Yeah. Isn't there like the, a colonial one, like a revolutionary war one? They always looked amazing, but I feel yeah. like they came out at times when I was already like elbow deep in another in game. Call of Duty. Like, yeah, something like that. <laughs> uh, so I, ne I never played them, but I always like enviously watched uh, the commercials being like, man, that looks so fucking cool. Uh, so yeah, I know it looks like Ubisoft is involved with it along with Come On Games and Guillotine Press. And we're going to take it out for a little two episode spin end of the month. Little two up spin. Uh, keep an eye out for that at the end of the month. Very much so. Looking forward to that. And we'll have news uh, as we get closer on yeah. uh, on cast and stuff like that. Uh, quick update on Glass Cannon Live. Philly VIP sold out. That's a wrap, folks. Yep. That's a wrap. There is only two tickets that you can get in 2023 to hang out with us at the after party. And that's in St. Louis. There's two left. There's two VIPs left in St. Louis? Two VIPs left Chicago in St. Louis. Chicago VIP sold out? I don't know. I'm, I'm just making it sound okay. good. <laughs> it might be sold out. I can't remember. There's not a lot of tickets left. There's three shows, and they're almost all sold out. Yeah, St. Louis was sold, sold out, out, and now there's 11 bar stools tickets left. Get those bar stools. We'll be coming around with some shooters. <laughs> This place is fancy, but they probably do shooters. Thank you. Maybe a random game of left, right, center busts out on the oh. bar. You never know. That you would be the know. seat I would get. I don't want to be fucking on top of the stage, number one, because I'm always afraid I'm going to get pulled up there. Like, oh, you want to be in the show? Get out of here. <laughs> Sit at the bar and then just get immediate also, God, access you get to Matthew drinks. and Skid spit all over you when you're up there. It's like Those a Gallagher show. You got to put the uh, tarp in front of you. <laughs> right. Uh, that bar is... Uh, it, it has to be the best spot to be in leading up to the show. Like if you're if you're there an hour early, just hanging at that bar. I mean, that has to be the scene for the show. So, yeah, definitely check out the bar seats. I think I think uh, something special there. And I'll tell you what, if the after party, the VIP after party is anything like what it was in Philly, the after party was at the bar. So if you have those bar seats, seats, those are your seats. You got, you got a seat. <laughs> you got, we're going to have to come to you. Yeah. I mean, there's just no way around it. Uh, oh, I can't wait. Uh, yeah. So anyway, pick up those tickets while you still can. And that is, that's all I got. That's it for news. That's all you got? Um, yeah. Which is fantastic. Let's move yeah, on to talking it. about the GCP. Yes. Particularly episode three. Of mm. campaign two which I, I i'll be honest with you i gushed right before we we went live here i loved it i loved the episode and i don't i don't say that often because i think that it sounds obnoxious but it's <laughs> true i was listening back to prep for this fodder and i was just transported i really was like i just had so much fun also we recorded it months ago a couple months ago and so like mm. i forgot a lot of the stuff and it was so fresh uh to me and the jokes were really funny and then i really liked some of the character exposition we got in this episode. I thought it was really cool. Uh, so we'll get to some of that in a second. But first, I just I want to go through and just ask you a few, you know, general questions since we don't have yeah. a, a traditional we are stupid. Um, last week, we kind of left it hanging. We didn't know if there, this was going to bust out into a fight. And we see in episode three, we straight up get out of there with the information we need without rousing any suspicion. Uh, Sid gets a bottle cap for a hairball. I mean, this yeah. is... Were you were you impressed with the execution of the of the score? I was very impressed because I kept asking you guys, like, what's the plan? What's the plan? And I don't know if I just wasn't listening or if the plan wasn't like solid until it happened. But I was just like, Whew, I really don't know what they're going to do here. But all right, let's just see what happens. And when Sid pulled out that vomit to set off the alarm, I just I remember being like, that was fucking brilliant. And <laughs> it made my job. So much easier. Yeah. You were like, and now like, we can just move on with the story. This is great. Cause I was agonizing on this. I'm like, I really don't know what's going to happen here. And I want to be your prepared. Initial, in your initial prep, did you think this was going to be a fight? Did you think we would kill the guards? 
No, no, I was, I think it was, I think it was pretty clear, especially as you guys, as you went up and talked to uh, Michaels, uh, <laughs> he seemed like a pretty cool guy. It didn't seem like it was going to go that route. Uh, but that's what made me even more nervous. A fight, I got the stats, easy. You know, it's the, it's when you start getting creative, I wasn't worried that I couldn't come up with a creative solution. I just wanted to be smooth. You know, this is episode three of our show, two of our show. Like, I want it to be like smooth. And as I'm reading this, I'm like, fuck, this is so open-ended. Yeah. And, you know, we don't do a lot of editing. All all these three of these episodes, when I tell you that like, then I mean, the, we're editing between multiple cameras, but the amount of stuff I'm taking out is like five small uh, cuts where we just had to like fix something, like really, really tiny stuff. So because of that, I want to make sure the pacing is right and that it feels smooth. And uh, I, I would have given her two bottle caps. I thought it was such a great idea because it, at the end of the day, made my job easier. I agree with you that I think the pacing was really good in this one. I think there was a lot of big laughs. I mean, I was just laughing walking yeah. around the on the street listening to it. And then uh <sighs> old Snailfoot Jones. <laughs> old Snailfoot Jones and what was it? Uh Wasp Knuckle. Wasp Knuckle and Ant Hip. <laughs> yeah. And uh, yeah, Ant Hip and Wasp Knuckle. And Wasp Knuckle was married to Bill. Bill. I think that's what it was. <laughs> because I mean, he wasn't part of the uh <laughs> The naming tradition. Right. He was an outsider. <laughs> uh, family by marriage. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, all fine. that stuff. Like that silliness, you know me. I have like, I have a low tolerance for it. Like some yeah. of it I I thoroughly enjoy. And then when it crosses a line, I'm like, all right, now you're just taking me out of the game and I'm not enjoying myself anymore. Uh, it came close to that. I think it was in episode two. It might have been a little bit in three with the... Uh, uh, the ladies night thing, the over and over, just like, we're so drunk, we're so drunk, we're yelling and screaming in the town square. I just started to get like, stop. And not only <laughs> as a player who's just like, move on with the story, but also as a character, I'm like, stop drawing attention this way because I cannot deceive anybody. So as, as long as we just lay low, you know, uh, so, but that, that interchange, uh, exchange, whatever at the library, I thought was just chef's kiss it was the perfect amount. Perfect the dose perfect amount. of silly. You know, there's 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 side quest side sesh, there's strange aeons, and there's GCP, and those are three very different energies. And people have to remember, like GCP is a much different show than strange aeons. And I think Matthew is just like forgot. Like, he's, he's still, still in side quest side still, sesh mode, <laughs> or like still in strange aeons mode. It's like, all right, calm down, ladies night. <laughs> we got it. <laughs> we got uh, it. We got but it. But <laughs> I still love silly, dude. Give me silly any day of the any of the week, any day of the week over anything else. Like that I mean, is if my you're not to. laughing at the table, what are you doing? What yeah. what are you doing? Uh, so I certainly appreciate the humor, and and then uh, uh, to me the funniest part is me squaring up on it, and Matthew being like, "Joe is clearly over this bit," <laughs> you know, like just <laughs> saying it out loud. Like that's funny. I just yeah. it, it cracks me up when uh, when he's like, "Joe clearly is uh, exasperated with our bit." Well, it feels um, like it feels like old old school GCP, and that's what I want. I wanted this to feel like we're returning back to our roots. So much has changed. Production values are different. Uh, the show's different. The cast is different and everything. But I want it to feel like friends around a table. I want it to feel like uh, you know, like what it felt like in 2015. And mm -hmm. I, I think we're, I really think we're achieving that. I, I, I felt that. I felt that in episode three. I definitely, not that I didn't feel it in one and two, but I certain I was just like, I was enamored with it. And it wasn't just the the uh, the story and the mystery, which is very, very cool, especially the exposition we start to get on Bolon is very interesting. And that the way that this, this character who perhaps I'm just going to say in quotes, villain, we don't really know yet, mm. is like... It's a great setup. It, the story makes sense. It makes sense why this person did what they did and why they're doing what they're doing. And uh, and there's a lot of layers to it. And I, I appreciate that. But then on top of that, and this goes back to the pacing, for as much as the silly uh, we had, there was also, I was just eating up the little individual character insights that we got in this episode. And not all of them were produced by the little fireside chat that we had. I'll get to that in a second. Some of it was just the interaction and the interplay of the characters when they weren't being silly. They they began to reveal little things about themselves and they're just starting to flesh out a little bit more. Yeah. And I was really interested to listen back to that. And it's actually, it's helping me play the game now, even further ahead where we are to, to re-listen to little tidbits that Talitha dropped about her past, right? Little ways that Lucky reacts to certain people and certain things. And um, it's just, everybody's, I think, really sinking into their character and I'm, I'm loving it. 
Yeah, and it's easy to breeze past Except that. Skid. Skid just seems lost. That character just seems <laughs> like, it, it, my God. I mean, Buggles is so phenomenal. And just re-listening to it, it's just great. It's great. Sorry, I cut you off. Yeah, no, I was going to say, it's easy to breeze past that. Like, part, there was a part of me pre-app was like, I feel like this needs to be, we need to, to combat. Like, going back to original GCP, it was like episode three was uh, the- The, the wall wolf, of Wolf Street. The wall of Wolf Street. When we've gotten to our first combat, part of me wanted to mirror that in a way. And so- there was this feeling like let's get let's just get there so we can get that in, but like you got to know when to let it breathe. And I could have easily done a longer episode, but I want to I want to stay around sixty to seventy five minutes. That's that's the sweet spot for this show because you know we put out a lot of content. I don't want to do two hour episodes. I don't even want to do ninety minute episodes uh, that often. I like that sixty to seventy five minutes because people got a lot going on in their life. And I want you to be able to stay up to date with the glass cannon and not be weeks behind because the episodes are too long. Well, I mean, you're giving them 90 minute episodes every week so far. That one was 90 minutes. <laughs> I know. I know. We're coming back down to earth this week, cause, you know, and then next week it'll probably be long again. But like, I, I, <laughs> that's, that's the sweet spot for me. It's a lot easier for us to produce uh, too, but there's always going to be some long ones. I know there'll be some three hour apps coming in. Yeah. Uh, but uh, well, you know, you yeah. got to kind of take the story where it goes, but let's, let's get to that point, which is the fireside chat. You could have that option to kind of push us forward after a night's rest out in the wild to get to whatever encounter is is coming next week. You've set up these creatures and we'll see what happens. But the 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 fireside chat, you decide to stop everything. Talk about pacing. Slow everything down and have the characters all really see what they do with this downtime around the fire. And it starts to really draw out things about their individual characters. Why did you decide to do it instead of pushing to the combat when that was your original plan? And Speaking in general to GMs, how often does that sort of thing need to happen in games? How much is too much, I guess, is the is the follow-up? Yeah, I mean, go, this goes back to months ago when I was starting my prep. I knew that this was the moment that I wanted to be the, like, let's check in with everybody. Because there's a lot of, like, you're kind of just thrown into investigation. It starts in medias res. This is the first time when there's, like, an actual moment to stop. You know, it's going to- And the players to, are alone, just with the each players other. alone, right. There's no other NPCs or anything. And you know it's going to take two nights to get to wherever they're going, uh, supposedly. So there's, there's an overnight. We know that. I knew this is going to be the moment to do, you know, what's become, I even said it on the show, sort of emblematic of what we do, these little fireside chats. And so I just, I, I really stuck to that. As we got to there, to me, it was like, this this is the time and I'm so glad we did it because it it really, like you said, it gave everybody a moment to start to reveal things, either through little things that they did, like Brother Ramius sneaking off into the woods to smoke, smoke some herb, reefer. Uh, <laughs> or, you know, uh, you know, just having the conversation with Buggles and his fear of horses and everything. I don't know. It was it was it was great. Yeah, I really loved the fear of horses thing. That was that was awesome. Um how much is GMs that are looking to replicate this at their table, how much is too much? We often speak in terms of episodes. Mm. You know, you're always like, hey, you just got to feel it. You just got to feel it out. Like, how do you identify that time when it's time to check in? Is it every time there's something monumental happens in the story? Is it every three or four sessions for a regular game? Like, uh, what do you think? Depends on your table, right? Like, if you got a table full of Nick Lowe's and you yourself are like, you just love the RP, then you can do it every session if yeah, you yeah, wanted yeah. to. Like, I don't love it as much. Like, it's so to me, small doses here and there are key. Um, it, it, you it, you got to look at like the pacing of an episode as well as the pacing of of like a string of episodes. And for me, this just felt like a good place for it. Um, so yeah, it'll be interesting. I, w next time we have one of these moments, we'll see like how much time went between episode three and that next sort of fireside chat, and like what happened just before. I know it's it's a, it's a it's a feel thing, but for a home game, it just depends on your group. Like groups who love this, you could do it all the time. Like I would leave that game if that's what happened. <laughs> what about these games are going to have Nick Lowe's at the table, and then? Joe O'Brien's at the table, who from time to time are just not going to have an idea when it comes to them around the yeah. fire. Uh, they just see Nick Lowe doing a, write his own amazing song by the fire and that tells like the story of his life so far or whatever. And then it's like, and what do you do, Joe? And you lock up, right? You free, you get stage fright. Uh, uh, he just sits there, whatever. Um, do you have a, 
I don't know, a, a trick of the trade, a way to draw that out of a quieter player to, to get them to loosen up a little bit and, and reveal more stuff about their character. <sighs> That's interesting. It's, it's you know, tough. You can always like point to the mechanics. Sometimes if you look into the mechanics of something, you can, you can kind of reverse engineer a good role playing moment. So, you know, you can be like, well, you found a scroll earlier today. Do you want to take a look at that scroll? And then you're looking at the scroll and the learning of that scroll could somehow lead to an interesting discovery or an item yeah. that you found that day. So yeah, if you have a player that you see, like they're just, they have nothing, you can start saying like, well, let's look at your, your items there. What's the story with that sword that you got? Like say Kate was really quiet or something. Like, so what's going on with that bow? You know, did, was, yeah. that, was that a bow that was given to you or, you know, you can look to the sheet. Sometimes just looking to the sheet can give you, um, I, you know, creative ideas when you're lost to come up with something on your own. It's great. I think, I, uh, <laughs> I think that episode three for as great as it was contains a major plot hole. I think there's a problem with the plot of this story. Oh, and it's possible that I'm just an idiot. <laughs> and I think. <laughs> I admit the latter is much more likely. I'm leaning and that I, way. <laughs> I may have missed something. Uh, I haven't. I haven't checked any of the feedback on this episode or anything like that. But yeah. in the re-list, and something seemed kind of funky to me, and I'm like, what? Did, what did I miss? It feel. It felt to me that the steps between Fionaris' quest to find out if they're fake or not, mm -hmm. to reporting the results of that, to being directed to the halfling whose name escapes me at the moment, Lemma Feldthorn. Lemma Feldthorn, and her Ta having Mulberry. And, and her having all of the information on the on the uh, gates outside of the city in the Wildwood and the guards and the way that it's all done and what happened that night and what Bolon is doing and all that kind of shit. Uh, and her and her being like a friend of um, of Fionara. Mm -hmm. Why did we have to do the test? Like, I didn't understand. It seemed like they all already knew that the gates were in the Wildwood. Well, it's, I feel like Fionara had a feeling, but where she was afraid to go, she wasn't allowed to go in the Wildwood, was afraid to even go in the Wildwood. She wasn't 100% sure. And I imagine her relationship with Lemma, while close, Lemma can only reveal so much to her. Maybe and Lemma never said anything about Bolon to her or this the event that happened that night at the gates in the Wildwood. Is that what you're saying? Well, Fionara mentions Bolon. Fionara she mentions does. that, the, doesn't she in the episode say something to the effect like there's this rebel, uh, oh, there's I this feel like steward. the first time we heard his name was from uh, Feldthorn. It's possible. I'd have to go back and re-listen to. But uh, yeah, no, m my thought behind it was like, Fionar has a very strong suspicion about this. But as a scientist, as a, you know, she, she needs proof. And she herself cannot go find the proof. So even if Lemma has int intimated this to her in their private conversations, she needs actual proof before she can move forward in her research. So you feel like Lemma never said outright to her, like, the gates are fake, you know that, right? Like she never said, and even if she did, she might still want some empirical evidence that that they're fake. Yeah, my thought is that in the letter, because we don't see the letter that Fionara writes to Lemma, you guys are just handing it to her, it's just like, it's something I've suspected all along, you know, and my friends have gone through and tested your gates. I now know it to be true, so let's not, let's not pretend anymore. I yeah. know the gates are fake, and I believe that they're out there in the Wildwood. Will you please let them? get out there. Maybe they can help you with your other problem. So she's yeah. very aware of what's going on in Seven Arches, but being unable to set foot in there, being unable to test things and really uh, dig into what's happening, you know, you guys showed up at the right time for her, but uh, I could see why that would kind of feel plot holy. Yeah, like on really the re-list and I was like, this Lemma knows everything. Why didn't, why did she just tell her friend everything that was happening and send us immediately to the Wildwood? But, um, but yeah, I mean, it makes sense that they could be close and not share all the inf secret information for right, sure. Right, right, right. And yeah. we put her to like a point where she now had to reveal all the information to us. I can imagine the two of them like hanging out at the caravanserai, like the bar at the caravanserai, having a couple of drinks and her being like, you going to tell me they're fake yet or not? And her being like, Lemma being like, ah, listen, I don't know what you're talking about. They're not fake. <laughs> right. I, I can't lose you my know, job. <laughs> you know, and then finally, you know, she's able to tell her that like, they went out there, they tested it. I know you're full of shit. You guys, they're, they're, can you please direct them to the tell real Tell them ones? what's really going on. Yeah, that's the way I said. Yeah. But you know, you don't get all that in the, in the show. It's just kind of in my head, but it, you know, leaves you to guys think about what, what that could be. But I don't want it to feel like a plot hole. That would be bad. 
<laughs> no, I know. That's why I was like, I wanted to put you on the on the uh, on the hot seat here yeah. on the fod. On the fod. Uh, all right, let's let's uh, do one discussion here uh, that was submitted okay. by our good buddy uh, Professor Eric in lieu of a we are stupid. There was no real major rules issues this episode, and then uh, of course we're going to get get in a little listener mail before the end of the show. Yeah, we are stupid. Uh, the question here is, <laughs> are we stupid? Are we stupid if we at our table have an extremely fluid and some may say against the rules <laughs> approach to exploration mode transitioning into initiative? And this is the the subject that Professor Eric brings up. He, of course, is not saying you guys are doing it wrong. Not by any stretch. He brings up what is among the community a uh, pretty hot debate because mm. a lot of people like exploration mode in its mechanical layout for how decisive it forces you to be, to be clear about what your character is doing in the moments before a fight occurs, even when you don't know a fight is imminent. Other people are like exploration mode is too restrictive. It's too one note. You're saying, I am just doing this one thing, but people don't actually do that. They do a lot of different things. They sneak and look around all at the same time. How can you, you know, uh, whittle me down into one area? It's really just kind of up, uh, up for discussion. But I uh, basically what he said is brother Ramius, for example, is, uh, detecting magic and is doing perception up against whatever this threat is that's imminent that comes at the end of the episode. And he's like, if you're going by the book, you can't have both, right? You can't get a perception check and be detecting magic. It, it doesn't work that way, uh, you know, by the book. So I don't know. What, what are your thoughts as I bring that up for discussion? Yeah, I remember when the play test came out, I was like, oh, this exploration mode is really, really cool. I like this. But as we've started to play and, and put the game into practice, I just, I, I prefer what we've settled on. It just feels more natural. It's certainly, in my opinion, better for a... Uh, a show for a performance, you know, mm -hmm. it's like, leave it, let it be a little more fluid, let it feel a little more real, you know, because you could very easily be like, well, I'm detecting magic, I'm doing perception. And when it comes time for initiative, I can say to you, be like, you know what, you can roll perception, but if your uh, knowledge arcana is better, roll that. Because you were doing both. And if you go by the book, you're not allowed to do that. How much more interesting is it for you to be able to use both of those? It just, it allows where initiative can have so many different things. And so you so rarely get to use anything but perception unless you're a rogue. Why not open the door to that by being a little more fluid in the way we interpret exploration mode? You know, the more it feels like a video game, the less, the less it, I, you know, Professor Eric actually has a good uh, analogy here that I appreciate. It is not a video game that it ends up feeling like. The negative argument is that it ends up feeling like a worker placement board game where you're like, in this round, <laughs> I'm going to do this activity. That's uh, true. Yeah. And so that was his example, which I think is a very good example. It's like that we're not playing a board game. Right, we're we're playing an RPG. Yeah, it feels very maybe because I'm playing a lot of Baldur's Gate. It just feels very turn based. -y, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, a, so I guess that would be more like a board game. But I think of a video game in the sense of like, it wasn't like D and D fourth edition. It was like trying to take it and make it like adapting elements of from video games into yeah, like World of Warcraft. That, kind of, that was the word on the street at the time that they were trying to capture that audience. Yeah. Yeah. And it, that exploration mode to me has that kind of a of feel. Um, and I liked it. I really did like it during the play test. I liked the idea of it. There was one adventure that I don't think we ever got to when we did the play test where it was like a hex map where you were literally exploring hexes. And depending on which hexes you chose, there could be... Um, different encounters or things that you find on this quest. And I was like, oh my God, this is so great. It's so different from anything that we've ever done and we never got to it. And then that one, exploration mode was really, really important. I think there could be a time if we're doing overland travel, for example, where we could be a little bit more rigid with how we interpret it. But I think for, the, for, for our needs, the way we're doing it works for us. But if you guys enjoy, uh, if other people enjoy doing it by the book, you could, you could do that too. Yeah, me personally, if I'm running a 2E game, I'm going to keep it very fluid and I'm going to let people roll whatever the hell they want for initiative at the moment, as long as they can explain it rationally. They didn't have to tell me in advance that they were going to do this in order to use their arcana for their initiative. If they say like, I'm going to use it because that I was doing this, even though I didn't say it, and that makes sense. It's like, 
that's fine. Here's uh, what I don't like. It's like, don't try to game the system, right? Like if you have well, shitty- sure. I mean, this all comes under the, you have to trust your players, you know, <laughs> umbrella. Like you can't just like assume in this discussion that you have like shitty, shitty players, right. then it doesn't work. <laughs> but it's not even being shitty. It's just like, you know, you can't help but want to be a little bit of a munchkin when it's like, we're going to, we're going to be sneaking. I'm like, all right, so you're using stealth. Even though your stealth is a plus one and your perception is a plus eight, let's all be clear here that you are sneaking. So you should you you should roll stealth for your initiative, um, you know, and, and no one wants to do that. But then, OK, then you're moving loudly. Is that the only other way? I don't know. It gets tricky. Uh, it feels a little si gaming the system. But then again, it goes against what I just said. It's like if you're perceiving and you're detaching magic, you could use arcane if it's better. I just think like. If you're well, yeah, actually why can't stealthy? you sneak and perceive at the same time? You can, you can. It doesn't right? make any sense. But like, uh, but no one's ever going to use their stealth roll unless they have a really good stealth. But if you're in a really really situation where you are sneaking up on somebody, uh, I had this happen in a game recently. I was deliberately sneaking up on known enemies, and I was sneaking up to. Well, I don't want to say too much, but I was sneaking up, and basically, I had multiple successful sneak. Uh, stealth rolls mm -hmm. and then i had a fail against the perception of the enemy and immediately it went into combat and my initiative was my last stealth roll that that's how the gm ruled it and i was just like that's fine like that makes perfect I'd, sense i'd do the same thing because yeah. that's a very specific situation where you are yeah. specifically stealthing up of course you're also perceiving but like it, it was a very you got to feel it out instance by instance. That's what it is. It's like when, when the stealth role itself is important, then you use that for initiative when it's not, especially where there's no uh, surprise round in two E, then you can do both and take the better, I guess. Yeah. I don't yeah. Know. Just, it always feels dirty to me. It feels uh, dirty. Well, what do you guys think? Let us yeah. know. And if, uh, and if you have any comments or further questions on it, uh, hit us up at contact at glasscannonetwork.com for a little listener mail, which, uh, which we're going to dive into right now. Now. Right now? Right now. All right. All right. First question is from journalist Joe in England. Uh, international edition, as we used to say, for our listener mail. Uh, this one is a, is a quick and great question. Uh, I always got to remember how wonderful the Nash is. Journalist Joe says, last Friday when the new episode of the GCP dropped, I didn't check the downloads folder on my podcast app, but instead went straight to YouTube. In short, is this a good thing for the show? Are higher YouTube views beneficial for the network than download numbers potentially falling off as listeners become <laughs> viewers? It's a great question, and we appreciate so much how, how much people think about it. Can I give the, the dirty, dirt, filthy answer? It's probably the same answer I, I would give. Would I say at the same time? Sure. One. Do both. Do both. <laughs> <laughs> Please it's do a, both. It's a yeah. dirty, filthy answer, but it's true. Bring up the episode on YouTube, play it, mute it, and just minimize it in the back of your computer <laughs> while you Take listen to it on your podcast. I've never done choice. that for anything that I've loved. <laughs> I know, me neither. <laughs> that, is, um, that would be very sweet. We don't expect anyone to do that. That would be but. very sweet. Uh, to be honest, there it's really, both are so important. No, one is not more important than the other. And uh, in both cases, the reason that they're, we wanted to put really strong content in both forms of media is just to reach as many people as possible. In terms of how you consume it, you consume it however you want to consume it. The more podcast listeners we get, the better that is for our brand big time. The more YouTube views we get, the better that is for our brand big time. Like, And to me, they're, they're equal in how important they are to drive up those numbers to get interest from outside publishers and advertisers to get involved in what we're doing and help us to grow the network. So there's no wrong answer. I mean, the, the best thing you can do, though, if you really want to sacrifice your time and energy, <laughs> do both. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, they really are so important in, in two totally different ways in, in, in many ways, uh, but they both lead to the same thing, which is, uh, you know, helping to get the word out there about what we're doing and, and helping us to, uh, you know, continue to move in the right direction. Our, our YouTube channel is our fastest growing channel, and I'm so glad that we did this. It was like a year and a half ago. I was like, I think 
the new show is going to be on YouTube. Even though we're, we're very happy with Twitch, I just see a trend in our YouTube numbers that like there, there's there's potential for growth there. This goes back, uh, you know, really specifically to when we did the um, – the the first friends of the pod there with Seth Skorkowski when we saw like all the people coming over from his channel to check out our channel we just saw these numbers and it was like this this seems like a great opportunity to really really broaden the uh, the reach of the niche while also still maintaining a strong Twitch presence I'm so glad we did it and I I mean our YouTube channel is already gr- gr- growing in the past three weeks we've seen the our the numbers double. Uh, over a 30 day period. Um, but of course, now that we have ads on the podcast, those downloads help us command better ad rates, bigger sponsors. Uh, so it's, it's, it's all gravy. Just, just, just do both. <laughs> just, just do both. Uh, but yeah, there's no, there's no wrong answer there. Just, just watch and download every week and subscribe. That, yeah. That's that's what's most important. Yeah. All right. Uh, one and more. Leave a five-star review. I've only seen a couple new reviews come in. Probably everybody reviewed back in the day. But if you haven't reviewed, go ahead. Give us a five-star review. If you want to give on anything what, less. Troy? On what, Troy? On what? Uh, on Apple Podcasts. Look I, at you. He's uh, coming around. Yeah. He still called it iTunes. I, was, I almost said ago. iTunes. I was like, <laughs> what is it called? Podcast <laughs> Connect? That's the website. But uh, <laughs> if you're going to leave anything less than a five, just don't fucking leave it. It, it does. It's not worth anything unless it's a five-star review. <laughs> Nobody cares if you don't like it. <laughs> people just want reinforcement when they go to these things. They just want to yeah, see people loving what they want to love. Jeremy uh, will round us out today with one more question. Thank you so much for writing in, Jeremy. Hey, guys. Jeremy. I just want to know if you have ever considered doing an evil or all undead party. I'm planning on running Blood Lord soon and have been curious about what kind of hilarious abominations the crew could create in that type of scenario. I don't think it would work well for a longer game, but perhaps a season of side quest side sesh. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that style of game from a GM player and business perspective. It's a great question. Uh, we have not discussed doing it. No. Uh, Blood Lords came up at one point uh, as a potential uh, actually for Jared, and that ended up becoming quest for the frozen flame mm-hmm. um he was reading blood lords he was like this is interesting um is blood lords all evil or is it all uh, it's all undead it's like uh i believe yeah, the it's, party is undead i believe or? so it, it's in like the pure undead lands it's like the it's everyone is undead it's in that it, i believe it's set in that that country that's like it's off the coast geb. where geb yeah i believe yep. it's all a story of geb yeah. So I, I believe they're all on dead and abominations and stuff like that. Um, me personally, no interest. I, I've never come around to having interest in that. Now, it do, you do bring up a good point, which is like, what about short form? What if you're just going to play 10 episodes of it and it's just going to be really fun? Pardon me. And funny. Um, you did it. You did it for side quest. <laughs> uh, yeah, I played an undead character, but I, yeah, I played a, a paladin. Like I, so I had to offset it by playing like the most uh, yeah. champion, right? So I feel like, I don't know. It just doesn't do it for me. It really does it for some people. There's some twisted fucks out there, Trey. I don't know if you know this, but they just want to get their rocks off pretending to be so, such villains, criminals. Uh, they just want to kill good people and heroes. Other people, and I think that this is a completely rational argument, just want something new. They've done the same thing over and over and over yeah. and over for 25, 30 years. They just want to shake it up. I get it, but yeah. uh, it's not something I've been interested in. What about you? Yeah, I don't know. I, I mean, it, it sounds fun. I'd rather be an undead or an evil character than a fucking leshy. Like, nothing interests me less than like a leshy. What are your thoughts on a full plant campaign? Oh my God, it's so <laughs> dumb. Like, I don't want to yuck anybody's yum. But like, that is not my cup of tea. I don't even like goblins. When Skid that said he wanted to be a goblin, my first reaction was, no, fuck, I really don't like goblins. I think they're stupid because they end up being silly. Yeah. Um, but I, you know, you know, a second later, I was like, anything in Skid's hands is going to be fine. Uh, I would say no to pretty much anybody else that wanted to be a goblin because it's good. It just leans too silly. And I, I, I like the silly. Uh, we love silly. We were just talking about how much we love silly. We love but silly. There's a difference between like it, like having the sort of uh, what's the way of putting this? Like, you know, what made Monty Python so great 
is that it was silly things happening in serious situations. You know, that's where the comedy came from. It was like ridiculousness out of like the mundane. When you come in over the top silly to begin with, you got nowhere to go. Like it's already too silly. You know, it has to be ground. It doesn't have to. I'm telling you what I like and the sort of shows that I try to build. It's like, have there be a base of something strong and serious and real. And then silly can come from that. And that's the problem with, to me, with goblins and leshies is they tend to be too like, <laughs> or a fucking pumpkin character. Like, I just don't, yeah, it doesn't, don't do, know, it doesn't, doesn't do it for uh, me. Oh, okay. I mean, I get it. You and I see, see things the same way, but maybe you're coming down a little too hard. I probably maybe, am. Maybe somebody can build a brooding leshy. <laughs> I'm sure you know, they a can. Serious, a leshy knight. I'm glad that none <laughs> of the cast listens to to this show because they would build a leshy just to spite me. <laughs> <laughs> That's their first backup character. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm sure like, I, I guarantee you could absolutely. But my initial <laughs> response to a fucking squash walking up <laughs> with a broadsword is like, get out of my game. <laughs> <laughs> That's oh a tough hill God. to climb. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, what about it? What about from a business perspective? Do you mm. think that there is legitimate concern? that you would have to uh, play a half-assed evil campaign uh, if you were doing it for a big, big audience. You know, like, could would you have to always, like, uh, kind of, like, shy away from the real evil activity? This is real tricky, man. It's tricky in this day and age in all media. I think it's a thousand times trickier in our business because it's a very sensitive culture in TTRPG. So we have to kind of, I always feel like we have to walk on eggshells. I think about like when we started, uh, you know, our comedy was one way and then we got, we kind of settled into a place that we felt comfortable that's still super edgy, but not like going into areas that it doesn't need to go into. I still like the idea of being able to to, to have a show where we could do that. But I just don't, I think it's impossible. Like I'd love to play cult or like vampire, the masquerade and fucking play it, you know, yeah, go into those. It's here. meant to be played. You could say, I, I always said that. Right. But like you could, it doesn't have to be that. Right. You know what I mean? Like, but it, it, there's certainly like the, the book is there to tell you like, you know, vampire, the masquerade had like, there were whole things about the AIDS epidemic and how that affected the vampires. I'm like, man, that is so interesting to me. But like, it, you could be going to be so fucking careful. I don't think we're smart enough to like be able to navigate, <laughs> navigate that, that yeah. properly, but it, it does interest me. And, and I, I bought the, the, the book for cult a few years ago after we, uh, maybe I guess it was only two years ago after we talked to Seth and he said that was his favorite uh, RPG. And I was like, wow, well, we can never play this on the glass cannon. Network. <laughs> but I would, you know, I, I would love to, to go there. And so, yeah, I think that if you're doing it in, in a way like we are, you gotta, you gotta be very, very careful. You gotta know, your audience um but uh you know if it's a home game yeah that's the other thing e yeah that's the other thing it's like even if it's a home game you gotta you gotta be very clear with all your players like yeah. what kind of evil game are we playing here are we just playing a bunch of like selfish people that are looking out for themselves or are we playing people that are going to like try and go out of their way to kill innocents you know and that are gonna try to like do really dark shit like hey if that's your game and everybody's fine with that. That that's fine. But like, you need to make sure everyone is on board. You can't have like, ah, don't be a loser to like the one person doesn't want to do it because that is just not cool. And what's the goal, right? Because like, if say we're going to do this for a series, all evil characters. If it's just you know uh, murdering innocents and like steal and like, what is? How are these characters going to be interesting to an right. audience? They have like, to. Be, they still have to be interesting. So you'd have to do something more than that. Any television show or movie where the protagonist is evil, there's still a, a goal there that is, if not altruistic, is something that the audience can could get behind, could right? relate to. Uh, Dexter was like a serial killer that killed other serial killers, right? I, right. I never watched it, but I think something, that was the premise. Something like that. I didn't either. You know, it's yeah. kind of like a Robin Hoody type approach to serial killing. You know, you would still need to find that. Now, I imagine these Paizo adventures are written in such a way that even though they're evil, they're working towards an even great, destroying an even greater evil. I don't think the end goal is like kill a god, but maybe it is. Um, so I, I, I think that would be the one of the trickiest parts as well as navigating content is like you have to build characters that people are going to um connect with and if they're just pure evil it's hard to it's hard for an audience to relate to that it's also not great uh even in a good campaign to have your villain you're playing against just be pure evil without any sort of goal that makes sense you yeah. know what i mean it, it doesn't make for a richer game so 
I don't know, Jeremy. Maybe maybe you talked me into at least thinking about it. But it it is it, it would be a bold choice. I'll say that much. It would be a bold choice. And uh, who knows? Maybe one day down the line we'll be like, hey, we gotta shake it up. We gotta do something different. And uh, we'll we'll get that uh, that dark twisted audience out there that's just waiting for it. I've, I've thought many times about going one of two ways or both ways. It's like having a uh, 11 p.m. You thought show. about going both ways? I thought about going both ways. So <laughs> clip, clip that. Don't clip that. Um, <laughs> clip like that. Don't having, clip that. <laughs> having a late night show like that starts at 11 p.m. that is like uh, content warning up top. Like this is a show that is going to explore some dark topics. Where, you know, it's like a cult RPG or like a really dark all evil campaign. It's like letting people know. You you don't have to watch this, but if you do, it may involve this and this and this and this and like things that most people do not want to take in their entertainment. But you put the warnings out there and then you throw it out there and you hope it doesn't destroy your business. <laughs> 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 Which I'm telling you, in TTRPG, it'd be fucking impossible. Like, is the word people just skew it and then Polygon will write an article like, oh, the Glass Cannon Podcast <laughs> did an all blah, blah, blah. Show. And like, we'd be done. So we can't do it. <laughs> but man, it'd be fun because there's some people be way into it. Adults would be into it. Adults. Uh, and then Cultured. maybe- folks cultured folks who like can understand that this is make-believe um <laughs> and then the other thing is like i thought about having a saturday morning show that's geared towards kids uh it, that, so that's where you can have your all leshy party so that like our kids yeah, balance could it out. watch uh in our pizza show this is something i've been like working on in the back of my mind for a few years uh you know as we start to add more content sometime in the next five years. I, I think I'd really like to do that. It's finding the right group, but having a show uh, that's like a, an RPG show for kids on the Glass Cannon That adults Network. would like. That adults would like too. Yeah, like, you know, like the best cartoons are the ones that you can sit there and watch with your kids and the jokes, you know, are going over their head, but you enjoy them as well. You know, totally. Blue, Bluey is great for that. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I, uh, I think that'd be Pig really fun. for that. Yeah, pal, dude, don't get me started on Peppa Pig. <laughs> Don't even get me started. Uh, all right, Jeremy, you made us go overtime uh, with this question. Great question. Thank you so much. Guys, please write in with more. Contact at glasscannonnetwork.com. Email with the subject listener mail and get your question in here and we'll we'll, we'll dig in. And uh, and yeah, we'll, we'll have a good time talking about it as, as you see here. Uh, that, that wraps her up. Uh, exciting stuff. Assassin's Creed coming. Extra Life coming. Uh, among... <laughs> I just oh. started playing Nick. More listener, listener mail. <laughs> Uh, lots of great stuff coming and, uh, and I'm really looking forward to episode four of the glass cannon podcast. It's little, fun one. Little combat, bro. Little yep. combat. And stay tuned for a new all bestiality show coming Wednesdays at 11 PM <laughs> to the glass cannon network. Bye everybody. Yeah. yeah.